thank you very much uh, for uh, joining this session with uh, with Panya Photo Festival, uh, with Panya Photo Institute, and also we have uh, Christian, Gwen, Moshe, and Nayantara. Uh, so this session, uh, we will have uh, four presentation, very short presentation, uh, that we will start with Christian, and then we will continue with Nayantara, and then we will continue with Gwen and Moshe. So, just uh, going to briefly, uh, Christian, the floor is you now. Uh, so I believe the, the first thing I need to do is to explain about GFS. Uh, so a little bit of background about GFS. The, the idea itself came in May, I think May or June 2018. It was it was almost a spontaneous idea actually. So um, it was also in Ramadan. Uh, I remember I'm having coffee with Swanti, uh, and we we're thinking of doing something that we need, but we don't have it yet at that time, which is a a photo festival. So Swanti has background in photography. I don't have background in photography. I'm I'm a journalist uh, for the last 15 years. So I'm not sure if it's good or bad for me to run a photo festival. So, but my involvement is more as a, as a show director uh, and sometimes an HR manager, and occasionally moderator. So everybody is like doing a little bit of everything. Uh, I've visited at that time, only two photo festivals. One of them was Singapore Photo Festival. So we learned a lot from other festivals in the region. And also, you know, learn from people who have visited a photo festival. But we do have great team at that time. And then less than a year, I think, uh, we have the first less than a year from you know, when we formulate the idea to execution we we actually have gfs it was a we have it for 15 days from june 25th till Ju july 9th yeah so it was we have 13 programs 64 events i think 70 speakers and we're having event in 17 venues uh with only 29 crews and around 50 volunteers so it was a huge gathering uh, we didn't plan it to be that big but and then it become now our benchmark looking at the 2000, 2020 editions uh, so if I see GFES, I think it's almost the same with other photo festival. It's, it's a platform for photographers and public to, to meet, to share stories, to exchange insights, to gather knowledge, new skills, networks. Uh, not sure if I can find one single element that differentiates GFES from other photo festival. Uh, but my idea at that time is to make the event more or less customer oriented, if I may use that phrase. So we, our, our customer, we see it at that time was the photographer, the photography community in, in Jakarta and also in Indonesia. So before the event, we had two gatherings asking them what they need, what they expect, what they want to see in the festival. So from there, we know we need to bring global attention uh, to the local talents. We do have lots of great photographers, but they are more or less undiscovered. Now we see more and more, you know, Indonesian photographers uh, have more exposure, international exposure. Uh, and from that gathering, we also learned that GFS needs to provide enough space for photographers to showcase their works. Uh, officially, we have around 
63,000 registered photographers. I think the real number is way bigger. And in Indonesia, there are only few publications, few outlet, outlets for photographers to showcase their works. So we want you best to be one of that major outlets for photographers to share their stories. Uh, and I think we also learned that GFest needs to be a fun gathering uh, where everybody from different corner of the country can, you know, come mingle and then talk, network, collaborate. Uh, it has to be uh, a fluid, a melting pot event for for photographers from different kind of genre, different kind of photo clubs, uh, different different members of association. So, so we want GFS to to be a place for everyone actually. And I like to believe we we've managed to uh, put our best effort to reach those goals in the first edition. Now moving on to the 2020, our second editions. We are still not sure we will have it this year. I cannot be a hundred percent sure. I mean, seeing the way we, the way the government uh, handled the, the pandemic, it's a bit chaotic here and nobody can tell for sure. Is it possible to have an event in August? Uh, can we get the permit to, to hold an event? Uh, so from, from legal and safety point of view, it's a bit difficult. And from financial point of view, uh, more and more sponsors actually withdraw their commitment. And well, I have a feeling that the rest are just waiting to withdraw their, their commitment as well. So. Um, a little bit pessimistic actually uh, looking at this year's event but we'll, we'll talk about it later how we cope with the virus challenge uh, we had for the 2020 edition we have moved the schedule actually from June to to August and we before we move the schedule we have around 40 confirmed speakers now it's only 20 confirmed for the new schedule. Uh, initially, we want to have GFS in seven venues. Now down to six and potentially down to five venues. So, yeah, I think that's, that's my short introduction about GFS. Yeah. Thank you very much, Christian, for your insight. Uh, let's talk about it uh, more later on. Now let's move to Nayantara from Photo Kathmandu. Uh, I will uh, shortly uh, read the bio first. I, I forgot to read the bio of Christian, so just shortly. Uh, Christian is a festival director of Cheap Fest. He's a Jakarta-based journalist, has worked for seven different magazines in the last 15 years. And um, now uh, he has also has written and edited several books, hosted a radio talk show, as well as given talks in various writer and photographer forums. And Nayantara, uh, she lives in Kathmandu, Nepal, and works at the intersections of visual storytelling, research, pedagogy, and collective actions. In 2007, she co-founded Photo Circle. In 2011, she co-founded Nepal Picture Library, a digital archiving initiative that works towards diversifying Nepali social and cultural history. Nayantara is also the co-founder and festival director of Photo Kathmandu an international festival that takes place in Kathmandu every two years. So please, Nayantara, the floor is yours now. Thank you, guys. Thanks again. Um, I was saying this to everyone earlier. It's really great to be able to gather, and thank you for organizing this. I have a couple of slides up, so I'm just going to share my screen. And, um, and in the interest of time, I wrote a few notes down, so I'm also going to be looking down and just reading from my phone so please forgive me for that but i just wanted to start um 
by sort of giving everyone some context about the festival and then also talk a little bit about some of our internal discussions that we are having here um, and how we are trying to sort of think ahead and plan for this year's festival, which is meant to happen in December 2020. Uh, so, Photo Kathmandu, the festival was established in 2015. Um, at that point, we were about eight years into this work that we are doing around photography, visual culture. Um, Photo Circle was established in 2007 and the picture library, uh, the archive was established in 2011. And I just mention all of this because um, I think it's for us, uh, you know, just to say that the festival is part of a larger continuum for us and it's part of a larger sort of ecosystem that we are, you know, um, working to build and create. And so I think it shapes, these things shape the festival in some particular ways. Um, and so, yes, I mean, the festival, uh, you know, for us is a way to strengthen um, the work that we are doing in terms of building uh, a community for photography and for the visual arts at large um, and for research and also for collective thinking and doing um, around the visual medium here in Kathmandu. Um, it's been a way for us to create a time and space um, also for a regional South Asian community to gather and to share work and ideas and inspiration and, and create bonds and friendships. Um, this is why we do what we do, I suppose, uh, with these festivals. Um, and it's also just been a really good excuse for us to invite, um, you know, the larger international community here to Kathmandu um, and for them to be able to, to share some of the conversations that we are having here and for them to be able to um, arrive and have a good time. Uh, we keep, we've been lucky that Kathmandu, geopolitically, at least in South Asia, um, is a fairly accessible space still. Uh, at least we, you know, can invite our friends from India and Pakistan and Bangladesh without major visa hassles. Uh, this is getting increasingly more difficult in the region, otherwise in South Asia. So Photo Kathmandu as a festival, we platform an exhibition program. Um, and the exhibition program is um, accompanied by public programming of various sorts. So talks, panel discussions, meetings of various sorts. Um, it's really important for us to use the festival, uh, use the exhibitions um, as a catalyst for conversations on topics that we, um, feel we need to create more conversations around um, in a more open way. Um, we also run an active arts and education program um, that engages with young people and families and educators um, with the thematics and issues that the festival and the exhibitions address. The festival also platforms various professional development programs in the form of workshops and an incubator program that we started in 2018 and portfolio reviews. And I mean, all of us are familiar with these formats and these activities. Um, we've also felt in the last two editions uh, a need to support more generative processes. So we run a six week residency program that leads up to the festival. And we also offer grants and we've also started um, a local commission where we invite local uh, photographers and visual artists to submit uh, proposals and to be able to support the creation of new work. So at this time in particular, I think we are reminded that Photo Kathmandu was actually born at a time of crisis. Um, 2015, October, which was when we had our first edition, was only six months after this incredibly, incredibly devastating earthquake that we had here in Nepal that killed more than uh, 9,000 people and um, over 400,000 families lost homes. And it was also a time where we were in the middle of like a really crippling fuel crisis. Um, Nepal gets all its fuel from India and there was this like very complex political situation. 
that um, resulted in a in a six month six to seven month long blockade so unfortunately Fortunately, uh, from the very beginning, um, from first-hand experience, we know that something like a festival and that arts and culture in general um, can actually play a crucial role in revitalizing our spirits, in stimulating local economies, and in rebuilding hope for ourselves as well as for the larger community that we work in. And so when this lockdown began for us in about around mid-March here in Kathmandu, um, we kind of tried to promise ourselves, which has been a difficult promise to keep, <laughs> I will admit, because times have been stressful. But we kind of tried to make an effort not to stress too much about the festival because there's like plenty of other stuff that we that is stressful enough, as you were saying, Gwen, you know. I think it's a really good strategy to try to minimize stress as much as possible. Uh, but we've also taken a little bit of time just to slow down. Obviously, things have sh shifted in um, in big ways in terms of you know our regular uh, work at Photo Circle and Nepal Picture Library also. And just taken this time to slow down and, and ask ourselves um, some very kind of basic but fundamental questions of, what the festival means to us, what the festival means to our community, why should we keep it going, and in what form and in what way. And so for the purpose of today's conversation, and just in terms of sharing, um, also because we had just this morning a team, uh, a round of discussions with our team, um, I just wanted to um, put a couple of uh, thoughts out there. These aren't plans per se, but this is definitely some of the thinking I think that will shape our plans um, in the months ahead. So definitely many, many things are uncertain. We don't know if we will be able to have a festival in December in the way that it has existed so far, if things will open up, if travel will be possible, if travel would, will be desirable, um, if funds will be possible, um, if um, gatherings even at the local level in smaller scales will be possible. So there are many, many things that we don't know for sure. Uh, but there are some things that we do know and we've kind of been trying to sort of bank on those things um, to try to think ahead and plan ahead. We know for sure that we, our commitment to this work, to creating this community is an ongoing one. And so we know that we want to, in the long run, continue this work. We know for sure that our audience um, our primary audience has always been local and we know for sure that our audience and our community that we work with here are definitely not going anywhere. Like nobody has travel plans, nobody's planning to jet off. So we know that our audience is here and will be here um, in the long run. Um, We've also been thinking um, long and hard, and this is actually right from the beginning, before COVID-19 and this entire situation, we have been thinking about issues around scale and sustainability. I mean, all of us know here that, um, you know, it is difficult to sustain these events, these initiatives. Um, fundraising is always, always a challenge. It's a lot of our, Sort of blood and sweat and energy and time that goes into it and so we've always asked ourselves this question about what might happen what might be possible if we were to scale down if we were to stretch things out over time and so certainly that's another thing that we've been thinking and rethinking possibly um, are the issues of time and duration um, so the festival happens every two years here and we've always kind of had this question at the back of our heads that, you know, if we were to take the same amount of resources, the same amount of energy, the same amount of the same human resources also, but if we were to stretch things out over two years, would we be doing more in terms of creating deeper engagements with our audiences in terms of you know even ourselves like we are also part of this community that we work towards 
serving and building, um, we've sometimes felt like so frenzied, you know how festivals are. And we've always felt like, oh my God, I didn't see all the exhibitions. Like I didn't meet everybody who came all the way across the world to meet us. And I didn't attend all the talks for sure, you know? And so feeling quite on the surface at times and feeling quite frustrated about that. And so I think at, at this point of time, we've really been asking ourselves, um, you know, if we were to rethink time and duration, and if we were to stretch the festival out across t over two years, let's say, what might be possible? We've also been thinking about space. Um, as you can see from the, some of these photos, um, uh, the festival largely takes place here for us in Kashmandu in public spaces, uh, in outdoor community spaces, on the streets, in alleyways. And it has always existed as this sort of pop-up, you know, kind of ephemeral space. Uh, and with that, it has brought about a fair bit of, you know, excitement and energy and, and magic. Um, but obviously, after the four weeks or the five weeks of the festival period, uh, it evaporates. And so we are now asking ourselves, you know, if we were a more permanent presence in the city, if even if it was a small safe space that we say rented or occupied, what might be possible in terms of this relationship that we are building with the city in terms of the engagements and the depth of the engagements or the richness of the engagements that we are able to create. We've certainly been thinking about community. I mean, the larger public, but also the community of um, visual practitioners who we belong to and who we um, cater a lot of this work towards. And we've been asking ourselves, given the situation, you know, will shifting some parts of the festival and some parts of the professional development um, online uh, be possible? And certainly we do feel that um, many things uh, are possible, obviously, online, such as this conversation that we're having here. Um, some things are uh, too, like, people you know who we would have loved to invite but could not have perhaps due to budgetary constraints travel their schedules etc perhaps might be more available now over zoom and other virtual platforms so on and so forth of course we recognize that the internet is a deeply um, unequal space too and so i think uh, and can feel like a not very intimate space too you know sometimes in some of these larger Zoom things, I feel like I've been like speaking out into the void a little bit. And, um, and so how to sort of uh, strategically, you know, work around some of these limitations and challenges is certainly something we've been trying to think about too. Um, a huge part of the festival, as we all know, is the, the gathering, the coming together of people and the human engagement and the interactions that happen that really allow for many things to happen in the long run. You know, we've been really thinking about impact, say five years, 10 years, 15 years down the line, the kind of networks that the networking that festivals are supposed to allow for, um, what that can result in. And so certainly, perhaps with this edition, we will miss out on some of these human inter interactions. But if we were to stretch things out, say over the next two years, um, and if things were to get better, which we hope it will in the next year, say the end of 2021, we might still be able to gather, um, perhaps in different ways, but still be able to invite folks to Kathmandu as and when possible. So yeah, that's where we're at in terms of thinking about um, where things are going, moving forward, moving sideways a little bit maybe. Um, and yes, I'm really looking forward to talking to some of the others here on the panel today and possibly to other friends who are here in the room as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nayantara.
So uh, it's interesting because uh, before uh, we we heard from Christian that uh, they're they're currently struggling. If they're not thinking, should they uh, continue with the festival or not? But uh, with Proto Kathmandu, you decided to just take things slow, and now you want to reflect. Maybe uh, you want to reflect on the time, you want to reflect on the space, and we're thinking about the format. Now I'm curious because because Proto Kathmandu is very famous with their engagement with the local communities and how you use the public space uh, and the impacts that it creates, like how the photography can trigger debates. Because I read from a piece from Jenny Spets, uh, she writes a, a review about your festival in the WordPress uh, website. Uh, the, the projects ab about there are no homosexuals in Iran, it was, pub it was a show in, in the stream. And it, it triggers a debate with the local communities and people really debate like, should you show that? And for sure, you, you, maybe you cannot have that kind of equal engagement if you put it in the virtual space. Or are you trying to think you want to get that kind of engagement also in the virtual space maybe in the later on? Or I don't know, how do you think about that? Should I respond now? Yes, 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 please. Yeah, okay. Um, no, that's actually... Homosexuals in Iran. Um, you know, just this morning we were talking about this a little bit amongst ourselves. And um, this idea of creating engagement in the public space, but with communities that, you know, where the festival lives, this idea of time and duration and having a more physical presence, a longer term presence in the community, actually, we felt even with that particular example, um, that we would be able to, you know, like at that point of time, that exhibition was up for five weeks, right? Mm. And we had these struggles with the community. Some, some, there were many people in the community who were like not happy at all mm. for this exhibition to be on their street, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's where the, the friction was. Now, instead of five weeks, if we were present in a community for two years, you know, mm -hmm. it would allow for so much more of a deeper conversation with that community, right? And so yeah. it would allow for, it wouldn't just be like a pop-up event, you know? And so how then do people think about this issue of sexual diversity, for example, and inclusion, for example, if we're able to continuously talk to folks, not just perhaps through an exhibition, but perhaps through other kinds of engagements around that exhibition, yeah. what might be possible, right? So I think these are really, I mean, that's a concrete example of uh, why we are thinking about duration and time and space and presence. Yeah, thank you. So, and moving to Christian, uh, the same questions. Uh, if a photo Kathmandu is really going to like a certain a deep kind of engagement, uh, I'm wondering uh, if you also want to create that kind of engagement or an, uh, is a virtual, virtual type of exhibition that's also engaging. I mean, especially in the context of Indonesia, we are archipelago. So if you have like some kind of virtual kind of a festivals, you could engage these photographic communities that is spread from Aceh to Iran Jaya to, uh, to Papua, sorry, to, to Kupang, and is a virtual exhibition, is, is not a, a solution for now, or are you thinking about it? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, can you unmute your, yes. Virtual, you yeah. yeah, 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 I can. Yeah, I understand, from technical point of view, the, uh, Internet connection in Indonesia is not that great. Mm. You know, any even for a WhatsApp call, sometimes it's not that good. Uh, not to mention virtual tour. Uh, second, I think that the the most important part of festival, at least for GFest, is the human encounter. So actually, physically meet people and talk and hang out and you know discussing ideas and collaborate and share stories and even i don't know i still feel like watching a, a concert or a football match on tv and you know, live on the stadium it's totally different experience and to have a 
also for festival. I think if you actually go and visit a festival and you know see the talk show, talk to the speakers, and then you know attending an exhibition and then see how they display the artworks, how they play around with sound, with you know with smell, and how the the works interact with the buildings. It's it's you know I don't think the the experience can be substitute by an online show yeah. so that's my concern yeah. uh, but i'm actually i'm 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 part of the non millennial generation so i'm talking as you know a person who is not really into this virtual or technological things i'm still learning about how to use zoom in the last two weeks actually so maybe for the younger generation it's something they you know consider as normal you know maybe they will they don't have a problem with this kind of event with virtual or online event but for me still it's from technical point of view and from you know the experience point of view it's i don't think we will have it we will have gps online i think that yeah thank you christian so now we're moving to Gwen, which I think currently having a similar situation like GFES, because a Singapore International Photography Festival already having an open call uh, right now. So, and you already put a schedule uh, before you, you put it on October, now you move it to November, and now you're also currently rethinking if you want to continue. But I will first uh, shortly, uh, shortly read your bio. So, uh, Gwen Lee, uh, after six years of experience in the museum industry, Gwen Lee went on to pursue her first love of photo photography in 2008. Driven by passion for photography, she co-founded Singapore International Photography Festival, SIPF, a Biennale International Photography Platform in 2008. In 2013, SIPF received a grant from the Art Council to further develop photography education in Singapore. In 2014, Gwen and Tim created an independent creative container art space called DEC, a photo center consisting of a library, galleries, and residency program for photographers. Uh, so Gwen, please now the floor is yours. Uh, please unmute your uh, microphone. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you again, uh, Pana Photo Institute, for this uh, invitation to share about Singapore International Photography Festival, as well to the, my fellow peers here, who are here sharing in a very candid manner about the struggles as well the rewards of uh, organizing a photo festival. Because ultimately, the photo festival is it's not a, a pet project just for oneself. It's a project that uh, really for the community, for the people around us. Well, I, I just going to start with um, sharing uh, just very shortly. Even at, at, at the moment right now in Singapore, we are under a circuit breaker measures. Um, this circuit breaker has extended. It meant to end in, in uh, the beginning of May and it has extended. And I believe that uh, in many of our in the region, um, or from Nepal to Australia, we are experiencing this uh, stay home uh, sessions. And there were, has been a lot of uh, discussion really about should we move arts and culture into the digital platform or digital uh, mode of presentation. Well, uh, before I go into that uh, discussion, uh, or perhaps a bit more sharing about that part, I, I would just want to quickly, very fast, uh, just, just go through uh, a, a short slide presentation about the festival. Yeah. Am I doing the right one? <laughs> okay, okay, great. All right. Okay. Well, the Singapore International Photography Festival started in many similar ways like uh, Nayatara and Christian has shared. It's uh, a lot of a love for the medium, a love to connect people and the belief that the power of photography can work like magic in people's life. 
And it has worked in many ways in my own life too. I often, from young, very moved by this medium. And I wish I could be a photographer, but I'm just not good enough. Well, my life has always been uh, working as a curator, as uh, someone, as an initiator or creator. And um, the photo festival started with a group of photographer friends. And at that time, I just left the museum and we say that we need a platform for this uh, gathering because there wasn't a festival before SIPF. There has been Pau's uh, month of photography that's organized by the French embassy, but that is uh, still far from the festival idea that we have. So that was in 2008, the festival is launched. And um, a lot of people ask, uh, is the festival uh, owned by the government or is it fully funded by the government or by council? I would say no. As a matter of fact, the festival is very much uh, relying a lot of uh, donations, sponsorships and people who believe in the festivals. And uh, it was only later on in 2013, as you can read from the earlier bio that the festival receive uh, attention and further support to actually expand our education uh, program. Well, the festival itself, it's, uh, the festival itself uh, opens in uh, the month of October and sometime we move it to September. Well, for many reasons, it, each edition we have different uh, uh, stakeholders and partners that come in wanting to be part of the festival. It could be the uh, library, it could be a museum, it could be institutions. But ultimately, people see the value of being part of the festivity, part of like engaging public into understanding, into appreciating, into um, wanting to spur this uh, community on in creation. So within this slide, Cicel could see that some of you can see that where we presented Daido Moriyama solo exhibition in our space in 2016. As well, on the left here is our presentation utilizing again the container to present exhibitions as well book as showcase. Well, we also have talks, dialogue sessions. Uh, at the bottom, you could see that it's a dialogue sessions with Yuki Onodera, as Tomoko Sawada and, and Rinko Kawauchi as a portfolio review. Well, I, and I guess that um, this format of festival is not always the same. Yeah, why, why do I say so? I, and I think um, it's also because I believe that the festival uh, based as, as a co-founder, we believe that the festival is a bridge between the creator and the audience. So, and in this bridge itself, we ask ourselves like, what, what uh, does our audience uh, always remain constant? Does it shift, does it grow? Just like us, we grow older with years, our priority change, our needs change. And um, in the initial year of the festival, we do carry out a lot of our professional workshops, uh, working with Magnum Agency in uh, mentorship programs but along the along the time this shifted because the community needs a change what we are looking at is how could we nurture uh, the much younger group the youth the teenagers could we see uh, a platform that can be recognized internationally so that the talents could be spotlighted could be picked up could be showcased elsewhere to a bigger platform outside of singapore so, and this programming changed. And uh, it changed because the, this bridge itself has to always bearing in mind that this bridge has to be making sense for people to use. And of course, we also see that the festival as a catalyst in a way that spurred this community to continue to grow, continue to create, and they should feel that there is a platform that they could actually look up to. And so that's where the festival come in. So, sorry. Well, uh, just in brief, uh, last editions, we have 250,000 visitors. 
uh, that stay out to five days in Singapore to take part in the festival. And on the list on the left, you can see it's a list of countries that used to visit. Well, it's so uncertain now, right, with COVID-19. But out of uh, 250,000 visitors, uh, uh, about 70, uh, about about 60 percent are local, and we have 40 percent visitors from over the world. So you can imagine what what does that mean to the festival in view of the COVID-19. Yeah, so I just going to continue on. And we has always been having a lot of networking with TOTS leaders, industry partners from Asia, Europe, and US. So, and all this collaboration has made this platform meaningful. And, uh, and even as of now, a lot of our industrial partners from Europe or various other festivals are struggling with a lot of uncertainty as what I have heard from uh, my fellow peers here. So, yeah, so, so what are we looking really uh, for 2020? The team for the festival is called Departing and Arriving. Um, the team itself really look into the migration history, culture of Singapore because Singapore is actually made up of uh, migrants that started from, uh, from, a, from the late 19th century, from the mid-19th century onwards or even early 19th century onwards. Um, and with this itself, we also look in the contemporary context of uh, what is migrant culture and what, what is the new migrants that we are talking about in, the, in uh, both uh, Singapore local context as well as global context. So, but as COVID-19 arrived, we started to take on a more reflective uh, point of view, like both fiscally and we also take a more reflective outlook. What does, what does uh, this year or 20 mean for people? A lot of people is telling me that um, 2020 is like, we virtually literally nothing because uh, there's no platform out there. A lot of platform are shut down. A lot of platform are cancelled. Uh, plans for by people to publish book. Plans by people to stage at exhibitions or just literally wipe off. Yeah, and but I, I and I guess that um, it's a time to really arrive back and think about survival and take on a more reflective uh, actualizing in fiscal space, going out to the public space. Interesting. <laughs> well, in the, in the past, we tend to run our exhibition within uh, gallery, museums, um, indoor space, white cube space. And, um, but, one thing I firmly believe that arts at this point could be such an important element to pluck people back to really connected to their feeling, what happened to them for the entire year 2020. And at the same time to look at how our arts itself, a photography in this case, matters to them more than just a functional communication. So in, in this edition, we are actually actualizing a public commission photography installation across uh, six train stations <laughs> across Singapore. And we are also taking on different public spaces around Heartland that goes from uh, Woodlands to uh, Chinatown to Little India across Singapore. And, um, and we are looking at encounters that people could have. I think, of course, the, there's also pragmatic reason behind because uh, with the COVID-19 measures, there's, there will be regulations. For example, uh, 100 square meter space, you could only allow five people in at one time. And you... You have, to, you have to have a safety ambassadors that do temperature measurement. 
So a lot of uh, rigorous uh, stats. I, I, I believe all these are important, but uh, but can you imagine that if uh, if SIPA continue with 20 gallery space and we had to actually activate 20 safety ambassadors and uh, putting risk of our volunteers and helpers uh, with this contact. So, so this is the time that we say is that this is the best opportunity <laughs> to push for arts in the public, really, because people would feel less anxious about entering into a particular space and interact and um, and they will be actually still able to be uh, you know able to be inspired by the exhibition presented by the festival so so this 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 is like a, a complete shift I mean from uh, inside we are going out literally out and we're looking at uh, projects that bring people that take on more reflective outlook yeah about themselves about our migrant history culture and in the today's context of migrants uh, population in Singapore which is a very big news as for some of those who may have followed the news in Singapore. Yeah, so, so that's, that's what's going to happen. We sort of uh, stretch up the, the time. Well, we, we stretch up the time between 5th November to 30th January with a good reason. Um, we are looking at, um, at the end of uh, COVID-19 we're looking at uh, the people in Singapore. What are the chances they could travel out of Singapore for a holiday? And I, and I think uh, it seems that the year going to end in a very, very dull and, and very heavy way. And the question comes in, could the festival provide something for our population here? For the community here in Singapore through photography festival. So, and in that sense, the festival will become a solace as well as a comfort in Singapore to, to, to actually come back to this uh, normalcy, to go back to way of uh, like way of living to the final things of life in a way. So well, we have a digital platform to bridge content to audience. Um, I want to emphasize that um, the platform is not a substitute, uh, but the platform is used as a value add to our existing physical content, physical exhibition, um, and uh, especially the festival application apps on mobile phones um, is to actually create and deepen interactions as people travel from one station to another, uh, they could actually encounter this uh, sort of a, uh, exercise if they download the apps to engage them in further critical thinking. And uh, we're looking also guided tours and talks that is moving to the online platform as well conference and portfolio review. So with that, I ended my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gwen. That's very interesting that uh, you actually uh, having a similar vision like Nayantara that you see a photographer as a way to uh, create comfort and to make people engage more with the feeling because Nayantara previously said that uh, uh, their festival is also a way to revitalize the spirits and hopes. So in a way, this crisis makes you makes you uh, makes you realize the potential of photography through this festival and it's interesting shift that you want to move this exhibition inside the gallery space and then you found out that the public space is a way to go and it's really connected with your big team which is departing and arriving so we are very excited i'm very excited to see what will happen next. yeah and i guess that it's um i have to add like uh to to actually carry out public exhibition is actually not easy in Singapore. Mm. Yeah, uh, I think due to the nature of uh, many 
cultural factors or historical factors, uh, historical past factors of uh, public uh, arts in Singapore. But, but uh, because of uh, the community, uh, our, our partners, which is the LTA, the Land Transport Authority, see the value of uh, this exhibition and that's when they come on board mm. as yeah. the space, yes. Yes, thank you. So now we're moving moving on to Moshe, uh, which is from Head on Festival. First of all, congratulations for your first uh, first world festival that is finished uh, on 17th of May. Uh, I will uh, read shortly about your, your bio. So Moshe is the founder and creative director of Head on Photo Festival. He, he has over 40 years experience in the media as a photographer award-winning television producer and director at CBS TV and creator. He has held lecturing positions at the University of Technology, the Australian Film, Television and Radio School and others. So Moshe, now the floor is yours. Thanks. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me over. And it was really interesting to hear the different experiences of the different festivals. And I, I can hear something in the background. So I, I will uh, keep going. So uh, uh, it was really interesting for me to hear the different uh, people, you know, with very similar experiences and very similar objectives for the festival. And if I could sum it up, uh, the bottom line is that it's a place to, the festival gives an opportunity for people to meet up and exchange ideas and talk to each other. And I think when we started the festival, I didn't realize it at, at the time. We started many, many years ago in 20, the first started as a small exhibition in 2004. So this is now what it's 17 years ago. And we turn it into a festival a few years later. It was only one exhibition at the time, but it started, let me show you actually, I'll share my screen and show you a little bit of maybe some pictures of how it started. So let me just see how we going to share it. Just one second. Okay, so share screen. And I want to share. Can I choose a specific item here? And okay, I'll do that. Oops, can you see my screen? Can you see the PowerPoint presentation? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that might be the easiest way of doing it. So, um, basically, um, that's the very first time when we started the, in 2004. So it was a very small uh, exhibition. Well, we thought it was a small exhibition. We ended up having about 400 people at the opening. And that was like done in, in three weeks. We just decided to do it and it just exploded, literally. It was like so many people. So there was one in one place. That's the opening that we had, I think, two years ago, two or three years ago. We had two and a half thousand people at the opening. So it's, it's, it turned to be a very, very large event. Lots of people coming and, and exchanging ideas. So the thing is, yes, pictures are great, but I can see pictures on, on my screen at home. I don't have to go to an event. So the main reason that we realize over the years that people want to get together and they want, they want an excuse to be together and they want to exchange ideas. So that's the scope of the festival now. Uh, this is the, the area of Sydney. Um, that the distance from where it says Sydney to where it says Paddington, it's only about maybe 20 minutes 
half an hour maybe walk, walking distance. It's not very far, but you can see how many spaces we, we engage with now. So the festival is really large. This is 2019 and back. 2020 is different and I'll get into it in a second. So we have, we engage with major institutions. So this is the library, the state library. This is the parliament house. This is the Museum of Sydney. This is a commercial gallery. This is the space that we create ourselves. Uh, we put the walls and lights and do the prints and basically have a, a whole range of exhibition, usually about 12 exhibition in this space. That's what it looks like. And we run some talks and and workshops and all the rest. This is just an example of one exhibition. This fantastic photographer, Australian photographer, she did the project about uh, um, kids in China that are uh, left, called the left behind. So um, that's an exhibition that we had in a church. So it gives you an idea of the scope of the festival. It's not just in a gallery, it's not, not just in the street, it's pretty much everywhere. This is Centennial Park for those who came to Sydney. Um, this is a very nice space that we're using in uh, one of the main spaces that we use. So it gives you an idea of that space. And we collaborate with a whole lot of uh, festivals and organizations. So we work closely with Auckland and a few other festivals. That's the space, the same space. We get a lot of students, kids, school kids coming over for uh, um, to learn about what we do. And there was an, just to give you another element, we, the exhibition that we curate are usually space specific. So this one was about water pollution. So the prints were floating in, in the water in the park. That was, um, Another exhibition about uh, gold miners. So we created a gold mine. People walked in and it was very dark. Um, funnily enough, that exhibition opened uh, the same day that uh, the decision was uh, handed down in, the, uh, in South Africa and basically was in favor of the miners against the, uh, the mining companies, which was a huge success. A very tragic story, but at least had some sort of a good good ending. So this is in the middle of the city. We 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 have a, we had the photographic studio to engage with the people, paste ups, camera that you walk into. That's what you see when you walk into the camera. Hoardings. So this is building sites in the middle of the city that we cover with, with images. Um, other exhibitions that we do, again, in the middle of the city, funny little uh, um, opportunities for people to engage with the festival in some other city. These are pictures in the park. Something that we did with the Instagram. So we posted pictures uh, every day. People tagged tagged us and we printed it every day and every day print, put more on the wall so it started with an empty space and grew up to a full full exhibition space covered with images and we've got flags all around the city to promote it um, talks this is uh, Ben Lowy I don't know if anyone knows him he's an American photographer it was a big big event we had uh, with Adobe we do this is that's really the essence of the festival this bit the rest is 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 nice but this is the essence so people get together and talk to each other so we do artist talks and and, and conversations so that was in the pub that was about uh, um, photojournalism because the space it's it's quite large so we organize bike tours between the uh, between the galleries these are some, some of the banners that we've got to advertise the exhibition. And that's about it. So it gives you an idea of um, what we used to do. And maybe I'll show you what 
it turned into very briefly. So this year we couldn't we couldn't do all of that, obviously. The, by the way, the, these pictures are not from one year. This is from about four or five years. So every year this is a little bit different, more or less events that we do. But um, it's roughly the ideas that people engage with each other. So this year we couldn't do that. We had to do something very different. So what we ended up doing was we developed the website so we could do a lot more engagement with people online because when we started, everyone was locked down, totally locked down. So there's no, people couldn't go out. So in a way, I suppose we were lucky because people had nothing else to do. So we had better engagement with the people. Um, I don't want to sound, you know, uh, what's the word? You know, it's, it's been really difficult situation for so many people and so many people lost work, but at least we could supply some sort of a light build this website and one of the main things that we did was um, we ran the online exhibition so developed that this area a little bit more so oh, now let me see if there's something here with some um, more um, I think this one had some uh, some other stuff so basically we created the website but we have also rich content so in this specific case we've got the images and you can go and see them large with with explanation what the images are this is about the files that we had in in australia um, in last summer so just before covid started we had this wonderful experience as well so and you probably know about it from from the news so that was part of the obviously part of what we did but um we also enabled videos and and interviews and all sorts of other things so you go to this one and you can see the the video and this audio with this video so i don't know if you can hear the audio but uh, when you go to the website yes we can hear you can hear yeah. so when you go to the website you can see a whole lot more not just pictures because we figured out that when people go to the website all websites are pretty much the same you know it's another picture another picture another picture we wanted to have something that's a bit more engaging so people say okay we can't see it in the gallery but at least we can see extra information that we wouldn't see otherwise. So this is just a, an example of, of that one. Um, so let me go back. Um, so there was one thing that we did that was a, a very large program. We've got uh, 111 exhibitions, I think this year. So, and they're from all over the world. So this one is uh, from, China, Chinese uh, uh, artists. Um, we've got one about the Vietnam War, but very famous photographer, Tim Page. Um, fair bit of Australian, but a lot of others, pretty much from all around the world. As you can see, it's 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 very significant program. By the way, all the exhibitions that we choose are uh, we choose with no names. So there's a selection committee and we look at the images and, and decide which ones will, will be exhibited without knowing who the photographers are. So it's a very democratic process. So everyone has a chance to, um, to, be, to be involved, to be in the festival. So, this, these are the exhibitions, but let me show you. I'll just go to another one so we don't have festival this year. We had 80 um, events 
uh, all through the, the festival period. And we program it um, twice a day. So we had about three hours in the morning and about three hours in the evening. So we could engage with people in different parts of the world. So the morning sessions were good for the uh, US and for Australia and the afternoon evening sessions were good for Europe and and I suppose Asia were sort of were lucky because there's only three hours difference. So people from Asia could enjoy both sessions similar to Australia. Um, so, so we had a whole, as you can see here, we've got artist talks, panel discussions, we had the portfolio reviews, uh, we had workshops, we had pretty much everything. So for example, this is one that we work with Adobe we had the sessions that were very, very successful. Um, we deal, we dealt with the, uh, talked about, um, I don't know, whatever, any, you can see here basically anything uh, that uh, comes to mind we had in there. I don't know uh, if we look at something that is uh, there. Um, this was an interesting one. We talked about teaching photography. So, so we had the, the session with a number of people. So we had the, an American artist and she exhibited with us last year and she talked about, uh, she's teaching at the university there in, uh, I forget the name of the university, um, but uh, in, she lives in Chicago, it's just outside of Chicago. We had another one Australian who's devised the program uh, to teach uh, visual literacy to adults. We had uh, Eyal, he's the director of the festival in Israel, and they have a program of uh, uh, teaching photography um, to, to the community. So basically the idea is that they give uh, cameras to, to the community and the community uh, document itself and tell its own story. So it's about empowering people to, to tell their stories, but in the process they teach photography. And, and Richard Sordon Smith exhibited with us this year and is the Dean of uh, um, Visual Arts, I think, in Norwich University. And for those who studied photography in university or in, in proper courses, like academic courses, he's the person behind um, Langford, um, um, what is it called? Um, uh, introduction to photography and, and, and photography, advanced photography. It's like the textbook for photography for the last 40 years or so. So he's the, the editor of the book uh, uh, after the, uh, the original uh, um, uh, writer passed away. So he was the, he became the, the one and they updated it. So this is just an example of a panel. We ran it live, um, as you can see, and everything has been recorded and we're going to release this later on in the year when we have a minute. We, we finished the festival yes, the day before yesterday. So just to give you an idea. So I'm a bit spaced out at the moment, um, but it gives you an idea of what we did, how we moved to to online and try to maximize uh, what we do. Now, I actually, we, at the time we didn't know how it would work and we didn't know what, you know, how many people would tune in. So I've got a little video that I literally got today and this is the opening event. So, because we couldn't have two and a half thousand people who said, ah, well, We'll do it in a place and we can have only um, whatever number of people in the studio. So we had about five people there, but we broadcast it live. We ended up having over 7,000 people uh, viewing it live. And that's, that's what it looks like. So I think it starts, okay. So that's the studio uh, that we organized. And that's when we started. Let me see. So it gives you an idea of what we did and 
Gamarua. Gamarua. Okay, so that's the Bajuri yeah. Gamarua head on photo festival. Very grateful. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. Welcome to the opening of the Head On Photo Festival for 2020. If you don't know me, my name is Dr. Ginsberg. Uh, normally, uh, I'm counting roses in a very whispery voice, but uh, tonight, uh, coming to you from lockdown, I'm very grateful to be a part of the opening of uh, Head On for 2020. For those of you who are here for the very first time, this is actually the 17th Head On Photo Awards and the 11th Head On Photo Festival. Of course, while we're on air tonight, Okay, you, you've got the idea. Um, what was interesting about this one, we gave the prizes to, um, to the winner. And as we went through the winners, we actually got the response from the winners. This is a judge. So there you are. Here is just an example of what it looked like. Maybe this, I'm not sure if this one was a good example. There was another one, which was a, ah, here it is. That's the, that's the good one. Okay, here it is. To have a narrative and to make a story out of that. And um, yeah, I will explain that. I'm happy to hear your opinions as well. I'm looking forward to the discussion. See you. Bye. So, the Australian runner up in this category, Nick Moyer. Yeah. Well done, Nick. The international runner up is Paul Carruthers. Well done, Paul. Thanks for joining us in the UK, mate. Well done. And, and look at this one now. And the winner of the 2020 Head On Landscape Award is Marsha McMillan. Yes! Yes! You won! Marsha, congratulations! Oh, wow. Oh, my God. So... You got the idea. And this is the sort of stuff that we couldn't have done otherwise. This is really possible only online. And we had amazing response to, to this one. And I'll show you some stuff. We, we, we had to, we just did a grant today, grant application. So everything is ready. So usually I'm not that organized, but, um, I'll just show you quickly the responses that we had from people. And this is just a very small selection what people said to us. Probably changed the course of my life. So sad the festival is over. It's been incredible, learned so much. Fantastic first online. I've had wonderful festival. And these are different parts of the world, actually, not just in Australia. Um, Thank you for giving us the opportunity. I, I rearranged my day to view them all. I'll have a withdrawals. Um, another fantastic one, it's been great. Uh, the last two weeks have been a blast. Well done for making this event still accessible despite the odds. Um, you know, And on and on it goes, brilliant, five stars, excellent presentation, I haven't stopped smiling. You know, oh, You can see, Unbelievable, you know. I, I I would never have expected anything like that in in a million years. It was just because we didn't have time to organize. We just did it, you know. We had no no choice. We just it was either we cancel the festival and lose our uh, sponsorship money, or go online. So we had no choice. We just decide. Okay, we'll go online. We'll see what happens. And the sponsors even even then said, "Ooh, we are not sure. You know, uh, we're getting a lot less and all the rest of it." But I think at the end, I haven't talked to them yet. But you know, I talked to them in between a little bit, so they haven't seen all of it yet. But I think at the end, they probably got a lot more than what they bargained for. You know, Sony, who was the best, the the, the main sponsor. Uh, if I show you this one, the video again, where is it? Whoops, 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 whoops. So they got at the very end, you know, where is it? That's that's their that's their uh, ad, everybody, uh, who worked on this uh, this episode tonight. 
to, to make sure it was safe for everyone. Uh, good night wherever you are. Um, wash your hands, don't touch your face, be kind, and uh, we'll see you soon. Good night, thanks for watching. So, you know, this is the sort of stuff that they couldn't have dreamt of otherwise. And we had 7,000 people there watching it. You know, it's probably as good as being on television and beyond. Um, so anyway, that's, that's our experience. That's uh, like the transition we did from being physical to being online. And if it helps you in any way, you know, great and if you want any any more uh, i don't know if you want to pick my brain you know we need anything else just ask happy to share thank you very much Moshe. uh it's very interesting presentations uh actually was uh, i was one of the i should write a feedback also on that on the pdf that you mentioned about the vista ah. <laughs> I joined. I joined two of your talks, uh, teaching photography and alternative facts, and both are uh, very interesting. And I don't uh, think that we have this kind of uh, sessions. I mean, this kind of session is very rare happening in Indonesia. So this this online festival, uh, when you mentioned in the beginning that it's about gathering. Now, when you put it online, now you can gather more people all around the world. So I think it's very yeah. interesting insight that you that you gave to us. So yeah, because uh, now we are a very short time. So I will go directly to the audience because we have several questions already. Uh, we have several questions from, uh, the first question is from Rara. It's for Nayantara. Uh, Hi Nayantara, I'm a big fan of your work and I'm very much inspired by the work that you do. This COVID-19 pandemic in many ways has revealed failures of our current socioeconomic system. This, is, this includes the very system that many photographers and photography communities are dependent on. We can see clearly now how the field of photography is also a field that is built on social, economic, and gender inequalities. My question are, what do you think photography festivals such, such as Photo Kathmandu, photographic education initiatives, and also communities need to rethink and reposition in response to this crisis? What themes, issues, or topics should we engage more? How do you see the role of photography in relations to social change? Is it too many? Or maybe the first questions. What do you think photography festivals uh, need to rethink and reposition in response to this crisis? That's the first question. And we'll move to the next one. Maybe. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, big questions. I, I, we could spend a whole day talking about all of that, I suppose. But um, by way of response, I think something that I've been feeling quite strongly in the last couple of weeks is that, you know, the current situation definitely highlights these inequalities in a big way, as, you know, uh, the question states, and as we've all been um experiencing and observing i have to say from the comfort of our homes i mean i'll speak for myself you know coming living um in a um in such a privileged um uh, situation at the moment uh when such large um uh, portions of our uh population um do not have these safeties and these uh, comforts uh, I think it just kind of reiterates the need to continue this work, to continue creating spaces for conversations, for thinking intergenerational, intersectional spaces. Just earlier today, I saw a friend uh, fuming online on, on Facebook. Uh, and basically, you know, there have been all these sort of online, um, you know, panels and conversations and they're just full of men, you know, and um, and she like, um, but these are just really indicative, I think, of you know a much deeper um, socioeconomic reality that uh, 
this present moment just highlights, I think. And I think it's up to us to sort of take that and continue to strengthen our work in whatever way is possible. Um, there are some needs that feel more urgent than others. Uh, there is certainly um, a lot of crazy crap going on right now in terms of, you know, sort of online harassment and, and violence even, um, uh, but also offline, you know, as we know, numbers for domestic violence is surging and um, other kinds of gender-based violence. Uh, so I think it in a way reiterates that, what is the role of a festival? Was that the question also? Was that part of the question? Uh, uh, the role of the question is to rethink and reposition in response to this crisis. It's very precise to this crisis. Right. It's, it's related to the uh, the inequality of the within the field of photography itself within the field of photography and in the the, especially the failures of our our current socioeconomic system is also related to that it's yeah like we're not prepared yeah for sure i mean these inequalities definitely seep into our community of of you know our community of uh, visual practitioners as well and i feel like yeah, I mean, you know, this year we had sort of announced, not a theme, we don't do themes for our festival, but we do do sort of a conceptual framework of some sort. And this year we had sort of committed to thinking um, uh, more um, issues around solidarity building, um, uh, collective action, collectivization, assemblage, because so much of a festival is that, is this coming together of people. And the imperfections and the shortcomings of these processes, because throughout last year, we spent the year running a seminar series called Imperfect Solidarities. And we were really trying to think about and talk about problems. And I think for me right now, I mean, just this current situation really foregrounds our interdependence you know as communities as practitioners as you know even to put on a something like a festival many many things need to fall into place it, it's it's really not just um you know dependent on us um and so really to think more about and and uh in, in real and practical ways think of ways to address some of these shortcomings Uh, quite a bit actually can uh, be possible online, perhaps as Gwen was saying, not to replace necessarily what happens offline, but really as a way to perhaps address some of the gaps that uh, we know that exist. Things. I think it's important to be aware of um, the inequalities that exist even in that online space and find ways to address that. Certainly in a community like ours, uh, just going virtual is not really accessible and possible for large chunks of our population uh, and our community of visual practitioners as well. So trying to really think through some of these things, we don't have all the answers yet, but uh, I think just to be very aware and also critical of uh, some of these um, easier options um, just to even you know hold ourselves back a little bit um, is something we would like to do and spend time doing a little bit more and talking to each other about as well so thank you Mayan I hope uh, that's answer your question Clara so next questions I think this is for Christian do you have uh, some kind of tips or a uh, uh, a recommendation for the first step to build a photo festival in the like the other provinces in the smaller cities because uh, sometimes there's this mentality that when they heard about the festival it must be like a very big and a perfect event okay well so it's it's a new thing i think for, for indonesia even for for GIF, for me for everyone working for GFED.
festival and what is a good photo festival. So, in terms of size, I mean, to have it, if you need to have it big, then it, you know, then you can do it. I mean, you can have a big event, but it, it's not mandatory. I don't think you can evaluate the a festival from its size or number of audience or number of exhibited works, for instance. Uh, I visited a great photo festival in Padang, in Sumatra Photo Festival. I mean, if you compare to compare it to GFest, it's much smaller, but it has its own strength. It's 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 very intimate, uh, and they have a very close relationship with the people uh, around the venues, and they interact with the local people, and then they sh showcase works that you know uh, the way they put the work on at the very old and run down buildings around the old town. It's a, it's a, and it's a very great festival. It's not as big as G-Fest, but it's a very, you know, I think it's, it's a very successful festival. I enjoy it very much. So, I mean, to have outside Jakarta, I mean, in other part of Indonesia. Yeah. And we, we do have it. I think we have it. Uh, there are, there is a festival in Solo. Uh, solo photo festival. I'm I'm not sure if we have any. We used to have a Surabaya photo festival and also Bandung photo festival long time ago. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, well, initially the the reason why we put the name Jakarta photo festival, not Indonesia photo festival, because we want to see more and more festival coming out in other part of Indonesia, and hopefully we can collaborate. I mean. If we can go somewhere and you know provide assistance or you know just be uh, you know helping them to 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 have their own photo festival in other part of Indonesia, we would love to do it. So yeah, I think that's my answer. Okay, thank you, Christian. I hope that's answer your questions, uh, Rizky. Now I have two more questions. One is for Moshe, and one the other is for Gwen. This is for, uh, for Moshe from Anton Gautama. Uh, he asked basically about the requirement to exhibit the work at the, at the head on. He asked why selected artists have to pay to exhibit their works. Meanwhile, uh, he doesn't have that other experience in the other photo, photo festivals. Maybe you can also tell him about that. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad actually asked that because we, we get a, a number of people asking us the same question and it's, it's it's an issue so really the the answer is the simple answer is putting a festival together costs a fortune and it has to come from one some somewhere now there are different models and the european model is that the government support the festival they get a lot of money they don't have to worry about anything so they can cover all these costs and just to mention some of the costs, at least here in Sydney, just, and I will mention some numbers so people get an idea of what we are talking about. The costs are, to start with, gallery space, walls, like the walls that we build, lighting, printing, framing, installation, publicity and marketing. So we print this book, I don't know if you can see it, each year we print a book like this. And we are talking here tens of thousands of dollars in production, just printing, not to mention distribution and all the rest of it. So, you know, when you start um, adding up the numbers, it comes to hundreds of thousands of dollars to put a show like this together. And I'm not talking about salaries and all the other bits and pieces that are connected to it. You know, this is the bottom line. How do you make it happen? Because it, it's, it costs so much money. So as I said, there's a, the, the euro. And then you don't have to worry about it too much. If you get a little bit of a sponsorship from here and there, great. It's, it's a bonus, but you don't have to worry too much to start. Like the basis is there. You know that it's 
secure for the next 50 years. You know, no one is going to take your, the money off you. The American model is basically you're on your own. You have to raise the, the fund somehow. So you go to commercial sponsors, you raise as much as you want, and the rest of it you raise from the people participating. Australia falls somewhere in between. So we get a little bit of money from small that we get from the sponsors uh, because Australia is relatively small. So we can't say we've got 250 million people, so it's not a problem to, to support it. And the rest of it, we, we get ourselves. And how do we get it? We run a, a competition and the competition brings, because people pay to be part of the competition, that money goes into the big, the big uh, pool of money that help us to put it on. And we ask the photographers to contribute a little bit as well. But photographers who uh, um, exhibit in the festival. Now in brackets, that competition this year, we gave $70,000 worth of prizes, $30,000 in cash. This money comes from us at the end of the day. So you may say, ah, oh, well, why do you give the money? Maybe you shouldn't do that and you know, use the money elsewhere. But cost, the cost of running the festival is a lot more than $30,000. The $30,000 would help, but it just part off. So we ended up with this model that we say, everyone contributes because everyone gets something out of it. It's not that the festival gets something, we are non-profit, whatever comes into the festival is being spent on the exhibitions, the artists, the whatever we do, every, every, every dollar goes back into this festival, nothing is left after that. And everyone who works on the festival earns very small amount. Like we are on almost on the lower level of, of uh, income in Australia. And we've got a lot of people doing the work for free, like we've got lots of volunteers. So the photographers, the public get something out of it, but the photographers get something out of it as well. They get the visibility. They get, potentially they get more work after that. Uh, they get connection to other people. So I think, I'm not trying to, to, um, um, to, uh, do it's it's we, there's no other way we can't do it other ways i wish i could say to the photographers come to australia and i'll pay the ticket for you and an accommodation but if i don't know how it is in in asia i assume i haven't been to indonesia yet yet i assume it's it's a lot cheaper than it is in australia but flying to australia from europe cost two and a half thousand dollars i can't do that Flying from Indonesia to Australia cost, I think, probably eight hundred or a thousand dollars. These are huge amounts of money. It, it's just, it's not possible for us to do it. So I think photographers need to start thinking, you know, maybe differently, a little bit differently. That yes, it costs money to buy a camera. Yes, it costs money to produce a, a story. Yes, it's difficult. Part being in a festival is part of if you co call it marketing. You be you are part of the festival. You get access to a whole lot new market, new people that may generate more work. I'm not saying it will, but there's a much better chance. So when we ask people to contribute to the cost, which is a small, small amount compared to the full amount that it costs to produce the exhibition. I think it's important that people understand that and maybe think about it a little bit differently. And instead of saying, ah, nobody else charges, why, why do we have to charge for this? They should maybe ask themselves, what am I getting out of the festival? Uh, is it good for my career to do that or not? And if they think it's good, then okay, it costs, it costs some money. So, you know, and then there's a conversation, you know, how much? Um, and we and we do as much as we can to help people 
you know, from different backgrounds so they can participate in the festival. Um, it's a little bit of a, how would I say it? Um, the people who can afford, we ask them to, you know, to contribute as much as they can. And the people who cannot afford, you know, we take whatever they can afford, basically. So we are very, we are quite flexible with, with what we do. But the idea is that I think that it would be good for people to understand how expensive it is to, to put a festival together. And I'm sure Gwen and Nantara and Christian and everyone who, who, who runs these festivals know how expensive it is and everyone struggled to put it together. Um, and, and there are different models, obviously, but you know, I think photographers overall anywhere around the world would be good if they understood how much it cost one and what they what the benefit for them and if they think that it's beneficial then okay so it pays you know you go to the shop you never say to the you know to the grocer i want this bread give it to me for free because i'm a, a talented photographer you know it costs money what can you do thank you thank you moshe uh, for your insight uh, i hope that answer your questions uh, anton now you have the uh, final questions uh, for Gwen. Since a uh, change like Martin photographers to more putting young photographers on the spotlight, uh, what is, uh, is there any different impact, especially to the young local photographers? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, can you unmute your... Sorry, can you repeat your questions? Yeah. So, uh, since you are changing strategy within your fest within the festival, before you invite a lot of big names like Magnum photographers. Now you're more focusing on the young photographers to be put on the spotlight. Is it true or not? That's that's maybe the first. Are you do you agree with this statement that you're now putting focus more on the young local uh, Singaporean photographers instead of the like the big names? And if so, if there's any different impacts, especially to the local communities. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, to first of all, to talk about the festival itself, uh, have both uh, emerging artists as well established uh, individuals involved in the festival. As a matter of fact, we see that both had to come together at the same time because the presence of the professional would also bring a greater uh, attention to the overall festival exhibition which is exhibiting alongside with the young individuals and uh, one thing I would like to highlight is that uh, through our open call which is uh, happen in every edition is one uh, platform which is a core platform in the festival to really uncover young unknown talents and it has always been the case we have participants who actually uh, as young as 21 years old that were selected as part of the festival over the years. So if you visit uh, the festival website uh, and click on archives, you will realize that uh, in the archives, there are actually different uh, individuals that we exhibited over the years. And it's a wide spectrum. And many of them are actually very young and upcoming or perhaps uh, just started out their career. So very similar to what most submitted their work uh, in, a, in a festival open call, the jury members actually select the work based on the portfolio, based on the um, ideas behind the photograph. So it's not based on nationality, nor age, or how prolific this individual is by the quality of the work that is being selected. So, so I hope that I answered the questions. Yes, we do see more and more uh, big names coming in. Like uh, in 2014, we have uh, Bern and Hila Betra's uh, participation in the festival. In 2016, it's Daido Boryama. Uh, last edition is where Mark Nivea from UK, as well as uh, Araki Nobiyoshi, as well as Rinko Kawauchi. There's actually more and more uh, individual, more and more big names coming on board, but I see that uh, 
one thing I feel that it adds to the excitement is one thing, but it also become like a good, uh, very good uh, way to to raise up, to inspire the young one through the works of all these uh, established uh, individuals. Yeah. Yeah. So it's basically from the big names is also at the yes. same time putting them into the spotlight also yes okay. so yeah thank you everyone so i think that's all uh we are actually exceed the time now it's for 46 years so it's for 15 minutes uh extra for the events so thank you i hope everyone is really learning something especially from the festival director festival directors in how especially how they deal with this crisis and what they do. I mean, we see this uh, kind of a diverse uh, approach uh, with Singapore, uh, Singapore International Photography Festival. They still going forward, but trying to shape uh, their approach uh, in the term of exhibition space and uh, where the photo Kathmandu wants to take this time to reflect about everything and uh, GPS is still trying to find a way and we also have a lot of insight from uh, Moshe from the head on and how this kind of a virtual festival also actually very beneficial not only for Australian maybe specifically but also mm. for uh, photographers for from uh, all around the world so yeah so thank you uh, so thank you. see you again thank uh, you thank you thank you thank you thank you so much thank you Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all our panelists. Thank you, Christian, if he's still here, Nayantara, Gwen, and also Moshe, also Yusni. And more importantly, thank you, everyone, for being with us. Hopefully, this session will be a start that connects us together. And thank you also to Panya team who have been working hard to make this happen. Bye.